All right, number 11. I have a table here with a bunch of numbers. Um, hopefully we don't need all of those. It says Tony's planning to read a novel. The table above shows information. Um, his reading speed, which is going to be important. The amount of time he's going to spend each day. Amount of time per day. Um, so it looks like right up above we can see three hours per day. We can see his speed is 250 per minute. Um, if he reads at those rates given in the table, how many days is it going to take him to read the novel? So our answer is going to be how long to read this novel. Well, let's, let's first look at his speed and his time. Um, he can read 250 words per minute. So 250 words times every minute. Well, he does it for three hours a day. So if I times three hours by 60, that's 180 minutes per day is what he's spending. And if you can do 250 times one minute, so 250 per minute times 180 minutes, that's going to give us a total of 45,000 words per day. Okay, that's words per day. Um, and then I need to know how, how long is the book, how big is the book. I don't think the parts help me. I don't think the chapters help me. The pages don't really help me because my speed wasn't pages per minute. But the number of words in the novel is going to help me. That's the total number of words. So if I do the total number of words, divided by, I can do 45,000 words per day. When I divide those two out, I end up with 7.75 days, which looking at our answers here, it comes out to be 8. So the correct answer there is B. Number 12, uh, January 1st, 2000, there was 175,000 tons of trash uh, in a landfill that had a capacity of 325. So still, still a little, just a little bit more than halfway full. Every year since then, the amount of trash increases by 7,500. And Y represents the time in years after that date, um, which inequality describes the set of years where we are at or above capacity. So let's kind of look at, look at all these things. Well, first of all, we want to figure out when we are at or above capacity. So at or above means we're going to be greater than or equal to Capacity was 325, so I'm, I'm figuring that's going to be part of this equation. Um, I started with 175, so I started with 175,000, and then I'm increasing by 7,500 tons per year. So I'm adding to that, increasing 7,500 tons multiplied by every year. So two years would be 15,000, three years would be 22,500. Um, so right now, I think I've got this equation built. I think the correct answer here is D. So it's basically the ability to translate a word problem and just kind of know what these key, you know, at or above, just to kind of know that that phrase means greater than or equal to. Um, increased by 7,500 per year. So increased 7,500 per year. Uh, just kind of finding those pieces and see the structure of how the inequality is set up. Number 13, a researcher conducted a survey to determine whether people in a large town prefer watching sports on TV uh, to attending the event. The researcher asked 117 people who visited a local restaurant on a Saturday, and seven people refused to respond. Which of the following factors makes it least likely that a reliable conclusion can be drawn? So let's kind of go through here and see what the problem was with this survey because what makes it least likely that the conclusion is okay? Well, sample size, I think we're fine. Sample size, we have 117 people, which is, is more than enough people. Um, the population size, they don't really tell us the, enough information for that to be a problem. Um, so I, I don't think that can be an issue. The number of people who refuse to respond you know, only seven people didn't respond, so that really doesn't seem like too big a number. Um, so kind of by deductive reasoning, it's where the survey was given. I think the whole problem here was you, you went to people who were visiting a local restaurant 
on a Saturday. So right there, you're 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 probably not going to get people who prefer to to being at a sporting event because they're probably at the event. They're probably not at the restaurant. So the biggest problem with this this question is that it was not a random survey. You know, there there was no randomness to it. They they went to a restaurant and, and got the information from there, which probably isn't going to give them a good sample of all the people in the town. All right, number four here, we have a little a little chart and graph. I haven't really had many of these so far, so let's take a look at it. And we have the miles traveled by air passengers in a country from 1960 to 2005. Um, and I always kind of, before I even start these problems, I like to kind of see what the what's on the axis. So we have the years on the bottom. Over here, we have the number of miles traveled uh, in billions. So just, just remember, all these numbers represent billions. According to the line of best fit in the scatter plot, which of the line best approximates the year? So we're wanting to know what year in which the number of miles traveled by air passengers in country X, so that's, that's this country, was estimated to be 550. So 550 billion is this line right here. And it looks like when you come down and match that up with a year, you know, here's where you got to kind of be careful. You know, if this line is 2000 and this line is 2010, that means 2005 is right there. And we're a little less than that. So maybe somewhere around 2002, 2003. Looking at my choices, it looks like C, 2003 would be the best approximation for that one. All right, number 15, we have the distance of travel around the Earth, in, or the distance traveled by the Earth in one orbit around the sun is about 580 million miles, so all the way around. Earth makes one complete orbit every year, so, that, so that's the trip. Of the following, which is closest to the average speed of the Earth in miles per hour? So I think there's going to be some converting going on here. So... Average speed. First, let's talk about what is our formula for speed. Well, speed, if you think about like normally driving a car, speed is miles per hour. So speed is distance over time. That's the general equation for speed. And normally, we're talking about miles per hour. And that's actually what we want to have in this, this question. Uh, the problem is, they didn't give us all the numbers that we need. So we do have our distance. We do know that our distance up here um, is 580 million miles. So our numerator is fine. Um, our problem is we need to figure out the number of hours. So let's kind of break this down and go through this. Well, it says Earth makes this travel in one year. So we got to figure out how many hours is that. So how many hours? in one year. So the science way to do it is kind of come up with some conversions and, and do some canceling. So let's kind of go through this. Um, we know that, let me see, we need hours here at the end. So we know that there are 365 days um, in one year. And we know that there are 24 hours in a day. So I got to be careful. I, I don't want to have days as my units. So I'm going to go, there are 20, one day, notice I put it on bottom. One day is 24 hours. All right. So I think from here, I've, I've now got it, got it set up. There's 365 days times 24 hours. And I should be able to cancel out days on top with days on the bottom. And so it looks like if I multiply these two out, 365 times 24, so 365 days times 24 hours in a day, gives me there are 8,760 hours in one year. All right. So my equation for speed was I needed distance in miles, which I have. I needed time in hours. Well, I now have that. So I think that should give me speed in miles per hour. Let's crank it out here. 
580-0000000 divided by 8760. It's going to be a pretty big number. And I'm getting 66,210.04 miles per hour, which I guess A would be the best answer um, that, that's closest to that. So the correct answer there is A. Number 16, uh, looks like we have some table data here. These typically are going to be some sort of a ratio or some sort of a probability or um, percentage. So we're talking about the bar exam. Um, we have, if you look horizontally here, we have students who took the review course. So we had 18 plus 82. So it looks like we had 100 students that took the review course. I like to get the totals there on the sides. Um, did not take the review course. We had 7 to 93, so we had 100 kids did not take the review course. Now, when you start coming down and you look at who passed, you know, coming vertically, it looks like 25 kids passed the bar exam, and holy smokes, a whopping 175 did not. Now, if you have your numbers right, it's always good to check. You should be able to add both coming horizontally and vertically, and get the same number. So there were 200 people uh, that, that we had the results for here. So let's go through and see what they're looking for. Uh, table above summarizes the results of 200 students. I guess they already give us that. Um, if one of the survey graduates who passed the bar exam is chosen at random, so that's huge, one of the graduates who passed the bar exam is chosen at random. Well, we always put that number on the bottom, how many we're choosing from. And people who passed the bar exam, there was 25 people. So if I choose one of those 25 people at random, what is the chance that the person did not take the review course? So people who did not take the review course, it looks like there are seven. Seven out of 25 would be the probability um, of people that did not take the review course. So the correct answer there is B. All right, number 17 says the atomic weight of some unknown element is 20% less than calcium. Um, so I have some unknown element. I'm just going to call it X. The unknown element is 20% less than calcium. That means whatever calcium is, if I want to be 20% less than that, I'm going to go 1 minus the 20%, but I want to change that to a decimal. So 1 take away 0.20, that's 0.80. And they actually tell me what calcium is. They say that calcium is 40. So if calcium is 40, and I'm going to go 20% less than that, I now have 80% of its value. And so that comes out to be, what do we get there, 32? So the correct answer there would be C. A um, couple different ways you could do it also. You could say, well, we have our calcium value, and then we're going to take away 20% of the calcium value. So we're going to go 40, take away 8, and we'll get 32. You know, that's another way to kind of do it if you don't really like the equation route. Um, so there's there's a couple different ways to tackle that one. All right, number 18 here. A uh, survey was taken the value of homes in a county. It was found that the mean, now remember the mean is the average. The average home was 165. And the median, which the median, that's the middle number was 125. Which of the following situations could explain the difference between those two? So why, why do we have two different numbers representing homes in a county? Let me try to try to simplify this problem a little bit and just break it down. Let's pretend that our county is very small and there's only seven homes. All right, so what's that? Five, six, seven. And let's just say that the home prices, I'm just gonna make these up. Uh, whenever you wanna find the median or the middle number, you line them up from small to big. So we know our middle home is 125,000. I'm not going to put the, the zeros in there. And so the smaller homes are going to be on the left. So maybe we have a home that's 100,000. We have another home that's 110. We have like a 120. And then we have this, this middle line, which represents the median. And then the houses on the right are, are going to be larger. They're going to be bigger numbers. So maybe over here we have a house that's 140 maybe a house that's 150. And then let's say that if we want our average to be really big or a lot higher, let's just say we have a house that's like 
$900,000. You know, so in this little neighborhood or in this county, you have five houses pretty close to each other and one really expensive mansion type house. Well, when you find the average, remember the average is we're going to add up all those houses and we're going to divide by, by seven because there's seven homes there. So we add all these things up and put this stuff into my calculator and I end up with it looks like one million six hundred and forty five thousand so one million six hundred and forty five thousand that's the total when I when I added all these guys up so I add them all up I divide by seven and I get whoa an average of two hundred and thirty five thousand dollars so that would be the mean so here's just a small example to show you how the same set of data could have one median number and one average number now how that happens is whatever side you're leaning to for your average that there must have been some big a couple big numbers in there so I think the correct answer here is C there are a few homes that are valued a lot more than the rest that kind of pull my average over um, they don't really affect the median at all because the middle number didn't change. You know, I could make this house right here. I could change it and make it worth two hundred thousand. My median's still going to be one twenty-five, but now my average would change quite a bit because we'd be taking away seven hundred thousand uh, dollars from this top number up here. So that's a way that the two can be different. Um, so your correct answer there is C. All right, number 19 and 20 is one of these extended story problems. So they give you some data, then we have to answer a couple questions on it. So it says a sociologist chose 300 students at random. And so this is kind of my, my total here uh, from each of the two schools and asks each student how many siblings he or she has. So it looks like at Lincoln High School they chose 300 and at Washington High School they chose 300. So number of siblings, so at Lincoln, how you read the chart is there were 120 kids at Lincoln that had no siblings. They were an only child. And 140 at Washington that had an only child. So kind of visualizing that, you, you basically have, you know, all of these zeros. You have a ton of zeros going across. And I'm not going to even try to write them all out, but there's about, not 300, but there's 260 260 of those zero responses and then you get into the people that had one so it looks like there's 190 kids that wrote down you know one so there's 190 there and so on and so forth all the way through um, so here at the bottom it says what is the median number remember the median is the middle what is the middle number uh, when you order them from small to big uh, for all the students surveyed so if, if you look at all the students surveyed, there are 600 total students, 300 at each school. So if there's 600 students, the, the median response is going to be right in the middle of that 600. So it's going to be the 300th response. So looking at my numbers up here, there was already 260 just in zeros. If I go another 40 in, somewhere around right in here is going to be my 300 number. So, and that's going to be in the ones. So it looks like my, my median number of siblings is going to be one. You know, you could also do it just on the chart here. If you kind of start building down, you know, you got 260 here, you got 190. Well, right now you're already up to 450. Um, so you know that 300 number is going to occur right in this zone. So that's number 19. Moving on over to number 20, um, it says, Based on the survey data, uh, which of the five most accurately compares the expected total number of students with four siblings? All right, so let's kind of go through and let's, let's tackle this. We need to find out the expected total number of students with four siblings. Well, so four siblings is right here. That's represented by, you know, 10 from each school, 10 from Lincoln and 10 from uh, Washington so we get a little a little piece down here at the bottom that I don't like this but they kind of sneak this down they say hey there's 2400 at Lincoln and there's 3300 at Washington 
So that kind of is going to come into play here because that's going to change my expected value. So let, let's kind of go through and let's look at this. Well, if I focus on Lincoln High School, which I'm just going to call L, 10 out of the 300 had four siblings. So I can use that proportion. I can say, well, if 10 out of 300 had four siblings, and Lincoln really has 2,400 students, how many out of 2,400? So I'm kind of creating a proportion here. And you can solve a proportion a couple different ways. You could cross multiply and set up an equation. But I kind of look at this and I see these numbers and I'm like, wait a minute. The bottom number just got multiplied by a factor of 8. So the top number is going to get multiplied by a number of 8. So that answer must be 80. So right now, I know that there were 8, I would expect 80 students at Lincoln to have four uh, siblings. So then we kind of play the same game at the other school. So now we go over to Wa Washington School, and we have 10 students out of the 300 in the survey equal, well, at Washington, there's 3,300. So to keep that proportion, or we would expect that proportion or ratio to stay the same, how many would that do here? Well, using my, my trick, I'm going to just kind of go 300. Looks like I multiply by 11. So here I'm going to multiply by 11, and that would give me 110. So I have 110 for Washington. So let's kind of go through and look at their choices and pick the right answer. The total number of students with four is expected to be equal. No. The total number of students with four siblings at Lincoln is expected to be 30 more than Washington. No. There's going to be 30 more at Washington than there is at Lincoln, according to my calculations. The total number of students with four siblings at Washington is 30 more. That's looking pretty good. That's what I got. And the total of number uh, is expected to be 900 more. That, that number is just kind of kind of outrageous there. So correct answer there is C. Now the only other way, I well I'm sure there's lots more ways, but another way of possibly doing this is if you wanted to do percentages, um, you could come out of here and you could say, well, if I focus on Lincoln, 10 out of 300, um, 10 out of 300 was, was four siblings, and you could convert that to a percent. You know, so I'm going to just divide that out, 10 divided by 300. And I get, and it's going to be kind of a nasty percent, but it's going to come out to be 0 0.03333. So we're talking roughly 3.3% of the population. Well, then you use the bigger population, and you say, all right, out of 2,400, I would expect 3.3%, which you multiply you know, by that decimal there. And that's another way to get the number of 80. But I don't really like using the percents here. I think the proportions are a little bit cleaner.